All right then guys, okay, what we're gonna go through with today is gonna to call hamstring tears, all right? So, everybody, especially when it comes into GA players and rugby players, um, you're, if you tear a hamstring once, more likely you're going to tear it again. But there is a be able, to, there is a, there is a way of trying to prevent that from happening. Okay. So first of all, let's start off a way and talk about a little bit about hamstring tears. So there's two ways of actually tearing your hamstring. One is when you overstretch it when you're trying to reach forward and that leg is kicking out when you're in full sprint position, or the next one is when that foot hits the ground, contracts too hard and actually pulls. It's too much strength in the tendon and elastic recoil that actually pulls that band, uh, band apart. Now, what you, where your general tear is going to be like, it's going to be, your muscles kind of start off in the tendon in, in its origin and then travel down. So let's say that my arm is the, the muscle. Up here is the tendon where it's attached to the bone. Then as it comes down and it comes onto my jumper, then it kind of turns into a, a, a muscle. And then finally, what will happen is it'll return back into a tendon down at the bottom. So there's two specific points that you're going to kind of get injured, and that's at the top where the inner, the origin is, and at the bottom where it actually attaches onto the so that's your origin up there, and that's your insertion. So that's what we call the musculotendinous junction. So where the muscle kind of turns into a tendon, or a tendon turns into a muscle. So that's where most commonly you're going to injure that that, that area. All right. Now with your hamstring, your hamstring is designed to transfer force up the leg. It's mainly your glutes are meant to extend the leg so they push you forward. When you start to use your hamstrings as a prime mover, then people start to run in run into problems. And the reason why people kind of go, oh, we'll strengthen up the hamstring. You can strengthen up the hamstring all you want, but if you do not expose it in a progressive fashion to high level sprinting and change of direction, then your, your rehab program is is incomplete, it's gonna fail, all right? Now, a lot of people will kind of gradually get you back into sprinting, but what you've got to consider is that when you tear the hamstring and how you tear the hamstring is how you're gonna rehab it. And generally, the problems when we come down to into rehab is it, it is strength. Now, is that strength, that can be strength in the front of your quads, as well as the strength in the back of your hamstrings. And it'll also be strength in your hip flexors and in your lower back and in your abs, because everything has to work in an order when you're applying as much force as you are when you're in a full sprint, your whole body needs to be able to absorb that force and distribute the load evenly, otherwise you're gonna end up with problems. And hamstring tears generally tends to be not, it generally tends to happen in full in full sprint, whether it's a stretch or when, you, when your foot hits the ground and then it just pops and it tears, okay? So there's gonna be a strength issue, so that's gonna be quads, hamstring, hip flexors, abdominal muscles, ability to rotate as you run as well, then you're gonna have a length issue. So whether that muscle is actually long enough to be able to lengthen, to get a good stride, to accept the loads that foot hits the ground and then draw and transfer that load through it and up into the glutes. Um, then what happens is that when you land that foot on that ground and it goes to transfer the load, you could have a mild perturbation where somebody might hit you or something like that and then you're gonna rotate that extra little bit of little bit faster is that hamstring going to be able to be long enough and pliable enough to actually stretch to allow that movement because our whole body works as a massive sling so if you think if you have one transfer one foot forward you can always rotate that shoulder back and forth in that running position and whether your hamstring is going to be able to deal with that all right so that's another part of it. then the other part of it is the, is the control which i mentioned your quads your agonist and antagonist that's like your bicep and your tricep your bicep tightens your tricep lengthens but your shoulder stays stable to maintain the, your your arm in that position so you have to have the control here so let's say that's in your arm there's your quads there's your hamstring this is your hip flexors and that's your glutes at the back and imagine now if you want to stay that strong and i wanted to do that what's happening here this is staying steady this is lengthening your glutes in that hip are going to fire and drive that elbow back into that position. So you've got to consider everything else is what's happening. Now if I was there in that position and then my shoulders started to move up and down, that's going to change the way that the force is going to be translated through, hypothetically, my, my hip, but I'm just using my shoulder to show it, but it's, it's going to change the way the force is, is going through like that. Okay, so imagine that shoulder went up and around rather than driving that foot down into that position. So how are we gonna? So how are we going to be able to um, 
to rehab this properly. So all we have to do is we have to look at what you're like in a sprint position. Now when people are running, what you can actually see is, is this back leg getting nice and straight and is it strong enough to allow this hip to come up and be able to lengthen into that position. So as much as, much as these ham, or this hip flexor has to be strong to drive that hip up towards the chest, it also has to have enough of length to allow that glute to lengthen into that position to drive that knee up. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a difference between forces. You're trying to balance them out. While you also, it doesn't have enough strength to do it, but does it have the control to actually let that opposite muscle lengthen. So let's say I wanted to contract my bicep, but this tricep just wouldn't let me do it. So it depends on which one's going to be the stronger muscle is, which muscle is going to get injured first, all right? So let's say your triceps are really, 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 really strong, and then my bicep works really, really hard because it's under a lot of tension. What's going to happen is that this tricep is going to stay solid, this bicep is going to rip, all right? Because so it's going to tear. So that's what's going to happen in, in, in those positions, all right? So why do we have to look at what's happening when that knee flexion is driving up? Do they have enough nice big strong leg to sprint through it? We're also going to look at what's happening at the opposite sides of uh, from the back, okay? So when, when you go to run, generally we should see a nice stable pelvis left and right. They should stay in that position. But what happens if you have an unstable pelvis where one hip drops down into this position so your glutes are not strong enough to keep you standing on one leg so what happens is imagine as my shoulder is there you know you should when you're running your shoulder should stay steady and so should your hips so what actually happens is when you when you go to run you put this this arm down on the ground is this one will kind of sit on the ground but then you'll shift across into this position and then that's going to differ the way you does that load gets transferred through it. So we have to look at, right, are we stable from the front as we're looking at you as you're doing a sprinting? Are you stable from behind? And also, are you stable when you go to rotate? Because a lot of sports are going to be multi-directional. So we want to expose you to enough movement patterns, make sure you have the right movement to get into those patterns, make sure you're able to lengthen those muscles against those patterns, make sure those muscles are able to control you at that lengthened position, and then make sure you have enough elastic recoil to pull yourself back into those positions. So there's a couple of different factors that you have to, you have to consider with that. Now I'm just gonna go over that one more time, just so you make sure that you, you have it, all right? So number one, you have to have a stable base to be able to produce power, okay? then you're going to have to have enough mobility in the joints to allow them to go through that full range of motion. You need to have enough flexibility in the muscles to allow those joints to get up to those positions. Because yeah, it's fine, the joint mobility is the ability to have enough strength to hold it in that position, whereas your flexibility is the, the ability of the muscle to lengthen, to actually get it into that position. So when you're, trying to, when you're trying to get into those positions, your mobility is going to be, if it's the shoulder, this muscle is going to contract to get you into that position, but this muscle is going to lengthen. So it's mobility at the front, but flexibility to let it lengthen at the back, all right? So you're going to have to be stable, you're going to have to be mobile, you're going to have to be flexible, you're going to have to have enough strength in those muscles, you're going to have to be able to rotate, but you're also going to be, have to be able to control the stability, the mobility, the flexibility while you're in that rotation pattern. And then finally, you want to have that recoil. So is that muscle able to, as you rotate forward, absorb the energy of you rotating forward and act like a spring to pull you back into those positions? Because ultimately that's what happens with muscles when they go to, when they go to move is that once if I plant my left foot on the ground, it'll absorb the energy for that and give you that nice little bounce off it. Like you ever see a gazelle running, it looks effortless because it's bouncing up and down all the time. It doesn't look like it's getting through a big labored jump up and down and it's nice and quick and nice and fast. So what we have to do is we have to expose you to all of these positions to try and make sure that that muscle and that joint is lengthening into a position that we that it's going to be favorable and it's going to be able to accept load. Now, how do we do that? Yes, you can look at it from the hips, but the key thing is, is that if you're not strong enough enough with those hips, 
your chest is going to come into play. That trap is going to come into play. And an example of it was that by the guy that kept on, that kept on uh, tearing his hamstring. And what we ended up kind of figuring out after a while was that it was his gum shield. Now, I know that seems a little bit mad at the start of it. But you think of it like this. When he was going to run, he bit down on the gum shield because the gum shield was a little bit too big. Now, biting down, when you bite down on your mouth, it's going to create tension in a pattern of movement that you need to be quite fluid. You look at sprinters who swim balls, jaws nice and loose, hands are nice and loose, but they're getting up into those positions nice and quickly. Um, their arm drive is quite good. Well, now, if you throw in something, let's say he was trying to run with a fist, that's going to be completely different. The muscles are going to have to work harder to adjust for that. And in his, in his case, it was his hamstring. In other people's cases, it could be his calf. It could be something else. Now, it might not be the gum shield, but it could be something. It could be a weak link in that chain that causes it to go. The rest of the chain might be nice and strong, but that weak link has just made sure it and it's just not able to, to work off it. So yeah, we have to take all these things into consideration. A lot of the time when it's when it's a rotational patterns, we're going to look at what that pec is doing. Is it overcompensating for that hip flexor? Because when you can automatically test this, if you lift your left, right leg, put your hand on your left chest, lift your right leg up in front, what you'll feel is if you're not strong enough, this pec will start to pull forward in order to try and bring that position in, but your hip flexor isn't strong enough, or the back of your glute isn't, isn't lengthening enough to make it, um, to let that hip flexor to work. So a lot of things to consider when you're going into a hamstring tear. It's every part of it is individual, but if you break it down into different parts and you figure out how your body is going to work as a system, how it's able to accept load, transfer load, how it can compensate as it's transferring the load, then you should have your answer about why you end up tearing, tearing that hamstring, okay? Um, hope that helps. Uh, any questions, just give me a buzz. Very, 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 very common topic, especially in GA players. Uh, where you have to consider all the factors and especially when you're considering what their day job is, how long they're commuting to work, how long they're commuting to actually play Gaelic, how long they're spending working and, and actually warming up and how much recovery they're getting in, in between sessions. So it's, it's very complex when it comes down to athletes, but it's a very, very topical subject. I could spend hours talking about it, but uh, it, it is needs to be a very individualized plan. Yes, strengthening the hamstring, doing your bridges and doing your bridges and letting those knees roll out, that is one component of it. But if you're not understanding how you're supposed to rotate through those sprint, sprint positions and actually stabilize that thoracic as you go to change direction um, and not collapse through either through the hips or through the torso to come down into that position. And you'll see those ones that if they go to sprint forward, they'll step to the right and what will happen is that they will kind of either lean forward, they'll kick out to one side, or what will happen is that their torso, they'll, they'll stick to that side, their torso will come down, and then they'll fling themselves back into that position, and they're the ones that generally don't have good lateral movement or rotational control as they're going to, as they're going to get into those positions. Hope that makes sense, guys. Any, uh, any questions, give me a buzz.